There is no question that something is here. Lurking. Somewhere in the darkened corners. But how will we ever find out what it is? We need to look. Always. And never stop. No matter what stands in our way. No matter what others may think. Explore the darkness. Shine light into it. Join the red strings and the silver threads. Everything is connected. Somehow. I am Mark L. Watson. This is Peer Beyond the Veil. First, I should say, introductory-wise, of course, I am Terry Lovelace. Uh, the story I'm talking about is Incident at Devil's Den. Uh, it relates to an abduction that I had in June of 1977. Uh, a workmate and myself uh, were abducted that evening. Uh, Background-wise, I'm 65 years old. I'm a retired attorney. Um, I worked mostly as a civil servant, as an assistant attorney general in the U.S. territory of American Samoa and uh, in the same capacity for the state of Vermont before I retired in 2012. Back in 1977, I, I worked nights in an emergency room. We were first responders. Uh, my friend Toby and I uh, ran a, a little emergency room for the, for the base. It was a relatively small base, a SAC base at the time, meaning Strategic Air Command. It was a nuclear base with armed B-52 bombers and Minutemen 2 IC, ICBM missiles uh, scattered out all over the countryside. And uh, we worked the midnight shift. We worked from 11 p.m. until 8 a.m. Uh, by choice. We liked working the night shift. And, uh, my friend, we worked together for about three years. My friend came to me one night and said, hey, man, I got an idea. Let's go camping. And um, I knew a little bit about my friend. Uh, he, was a, he was from Flint, Michigan. He was a city kid. I'm a city kid. I knew that I had never been camping. I told him... I don't think you've ever been camping, you know, what, what, what brought on this idea? And peculiar thing about Toby that I wish I'd had a chance to more explore more deeply, and that was that he was absolutely fascinated with the night sky. Um, he took physics classes at the local Extension University and aced them. He's a very bright kid and planned to attend University of Michigan to study physics and then on to astronomy or cosmology. I knew where I was going. I wanted to go to University of Michigan and go to law school, which I did. Um, and we just made a good pair. We were kind of the academics in the squadron, if you know what I mean. I don't think the word nerds was really a, uh, in a lexicon at that, at that back then, but, you know, we, uh, we took a different approach to things, you know. And uh, so he wanted to make this camping trip because he had heard that there was a piece of high ground. And he wanted to camp there so he could, he could have an unobstructed view of the night sky without light pollution. He knew that I had a brand new camera that I wanted to try out. I had a dark room set up in my uh, house and was just an amateur photographer making black and white prints. Uh, but when you live, we, we both lived on the base. And when you live on a nuclear base, there's not a heck of a lot you can do with a camera. Um, I mean, it's, you got to get off base to use it. So... He convinced me this would be a good idea, and um, from that it became an obsession, and we we really did become obsessed about the thing. Uh, in retrospect, it's just kind of an ill-conceived, crazy thing. Um, this world that we all obsess over, this world of paranormal and spiritual and extraterrestrial research, is filled with stories and anecdotes that either verify or nullify our beliefs. Many are hearsay, tales that are passed on from sources unknown, the details around them fluttering and changing like the winds. It's often hard to distinguish what is real and what is merely folklore. 
Then occasionally, a story comes along that is different. A story that smacks you between the eyes, makes you question everything. It validates things you perhaps suspected may be true, but adds more questions to the ever-growing list. My guest tonight brings us his story, and it's all of that. A story that begins, as most do, with an innocent event, an unremarkable day, an unsuspecting participant. But one that ends with the world on its head, and lives changed irreparably. In an extended Halloween special, we changed the format of the show slightly to welcome former Assistant Attorney General Terry Lovelace to the show, to tell us the incredibly disturbing tale of what happens when you have no choice but to peer beyond the veil. We made, you know, like we were, we made lists of things to bring and, you know, took a scientific approach to it and, uh, you know, left a lot of stuff behind, which just wasn't, we just weren't that inept. It was just a strange way the thing all kicked off. Uh, we were half, it's a three and a half hour drive south from Whiteman Air Force Base. Uh, it's in a northwest corner of uh, Arkansas. And uh, f- about three hours into our ride, I realized I had a camera bag with my, all my lenses, a bunch of uh, variety of infrared, black and white film, all kinds of stuff I wanted to try, filters. I had it all in my camera bag, and I left it on my kitchen counter. And that's just insane. I mean, Toby had a camera, so, you know, at least we had a camera. Um, but I'm just not that inept. Uh, I had a, a, a lantern, an axe, a bunch of stuff to bring that I forgot. Uh, you know, Toby forgot um, half of the food items he was supposed to bring. You know, luckily our wives helped pack some stuff for us or we'd have been, uh, been much Why worse. do you think that was? Why do you think that might have been? Have you given any thought to what might have caused the lapse in judgment on both your parts that you would have forgotten things you wouldn't have otherwise? I've given that a great deal of thought and I don't understand it. I, I can't reconcile it. Um, we're both, I mean, we were preparing, we were stocking our car to take a trip. I mean, on a daily basis, we stocked an ambulance and knew how to, uh, you know, we just weren't that, we weren't this inept. It was just out of character for us. So I don't know, but I, I, I feel that there was something more at play, but that's, you know, just an assumption on my part. Sure, sure. So we, uh, we had planned to dodge the park rangers and drive to this area of high ground that Toby had heard about. Um, and, and that's what we did. We didn't get a camping permit. We were going to camp remotely, just out, out on our own. And I may have sent you some photographs of the place. It's, uh, it's in the wilderness. It really is. It's, uh, at the edges of the photograph, you can see some buildings now, like some farm buildings. But none of that was there back in 1977. It was absolutely desolate. So we, uh, we took a paved road to, till it became a gravel road, till it became a dirt road. And we came to a uh, chain across the road with a very sternly worded sign that said, keep out, do not enter, you know, off limits, no hiking, camping, hunting, fishing, blah, blah, blah. And I stopped the car and I told Toby, oh man, I guess we got to turn around. He's like, no, wait a minute. Um, And he was very observant. What they'd done is they had two posts, one on either side of the road, and they had draped this chain across. And I guess because they were lazy probably, they didn't want to have to lock it and unlock it every time. What they did was they had looped the chain around on itself and locked it to make a noose and draped it over a nail on the other side, on the post on the opposite side. And Toby spotted that. So he hopped out of the car and just lifted it up and dropped it. And boom, we were in. And, uh, man, was it private land? I'm sorry? Is it private land? Who, whose sign was it? Uh, we didn't know it at the time. We thought it was some type of nature preserve. Um, if you go on Google Earth, uh, you'll find that it's federal land. Uh, it has been mm-hmm. federal land. 
we weren't actually in Devil's Den State Park. When we crossed that uh, chain, we entered uh, restricted federal land, and it's restricted federal territory to this day. You, you, you can't get in without permission. Um, you can call, I call, just to see what happened, I call the Park Service uh, and ask them, hey, I'd like to camp up there. Where, where can I get a permit? And, Sorry, it's out of our jurisdiction. That's federal land. you got to talk to the feds. Oh, who do I talk to? Well, I'll talk to the Bureau of Land Management. Well, you know, that doesn't work. <laughs> Nobody's going to talk to you. Nobody's going to give you permission. So, but we were thrilled. We, we were absolutely thrilled. We were psyched. And we, we drove in. And again, oddly, in retrospect, Toby knew where to turn. I mean, yeah, we could see the thing off in the distance. But the road looked the same everywhere we went. And there were a lot of turns and uh, he navigated us there and uh, he found a, a pencil and a bank envelope in my uh, in my uh, glove box in my car and he made a little map and I'm like what are you doing that for and he's like because when we go to leave here he says this place all looks the same I want to make sure I can get us out of here well thank God he did that because that would come in handy uh, soon So we came to this plateau and took a very steep incline up and it's still there, it's just a dirt road. And when we crested the top of this hill, it was just breathtaking because this, I call it a meadow. Uh, it was just this beautiful field of um, wild, late blooming wildflowers uh, and a little less than knee high grass. And it was just gorgeous. It was absolutely stunning. From that plateau, we could see the tops of the trees in the forest. That's how high up we were. So I'm sure we do, and we did. We had a stunning view of the night sky. It was amazing. Um, and we set up our camp, and I'll kind of cut to the chase here. We set up our camp, and you know, we did all the fun stuff you do when you camp. Uh, neither one of us had ever been camping before, so we're kind of like winging it. Um, but you know, like my friend said, it ain't rocket science. So, you know, we had a, $10 cheap Kmart tent, some blow up air mattresses. Uh, we swiped a couple mat, uh, blankets from the hospital. We had military strength uh, DEET to keep the insects off. We had sunscreen. Um, Toby's wife and my wife, they got together, they packed. We had a cooler packed and uh, we were all set. So we. Uh, you know, built a bonfire and, uh, you know, burned up some hot dogs and, uh, you know, uh, ate some chips and just had a nice, had a nice evening. And uh, we had an air mattress, each of us, on one of us on either side of this fire. So we're about maybe 10 feet away. And uh, we're talking and just kind of laughing and just having a good time. And I remember telling him, I remember saying, you know, Toby, I understand the allure of camping. I can see why people would like this, because this is really very pleasant, and I said, because it was. Um, and we had a nice gentle breeze, and it was just beautiful. And probably 15 minutes later, and this sounds so cliche, it's almost embarrassing to say, because it sounds like something from a movie, I know. Um, but I swear to God, it's true. And I've had other people validate that they experienced the same thing. And that was all these all these insects uh, and tree frogs, all the, all the noises that the forest makes at night um, were so loud that we were having difficulty talking. You know, had to raise our voice to talk to one another. And those fell silent. And uh, that unnerved me. Didn't phase my friend, you know, like he would know, you know. Uh, and, and then I noticed we even lost the breeze. So it was not only, it was not only quiet, it was still. And uh, had I been there by myself, I'd, I'd, I'd have been out of there. Um, I, you know, I asked my friend, you know, hey, does this seem normal to you? He's like, oh, yeah, you know, we've been laughing, cutting up, they, you know, we made a lot of noise. Don't worry about it. The crickets, they'll be back. They'll be back. You watch. So we're... Uh, 
we're chatting and there's another lull in our conversation and my buddy has his head turned to the left and he's looking at something. And I'm about to ask him, hey man, what are you looking at? And he asked me, first he says, hey Terry, were those lights there before? And I'm like, what lights? What are you talking about, man? Because where, where he was, his torso, we were both sitting on these air mattresses, his torso was in the way of, of me seeing the horizon where these things sat. So I had to take a step, stand up and take a step back, and then I could see them. There were three tiny stars, um, each one about as bright as the North Star. So they were, they were, they were fairly bright. Uh, they looked, kind of looked artificial, but they twinkled like stars. And they were in this tight triangular configuration and uh, it caught our interest. And my friend said, you know, maybe this is an airplane. And we were familiar with aircraft. And I'm like, no, nah, man, it's not moving. He's like, yeah, but, you know, but if it's headed our direction, it could just could be an optical illusion. If, you know, if we wait a moment, it would probably move in a different direction. And we waited and it didn't move. And it was too far off the horizon. It would have been like a train or a parking lot or something. And then, uh, then it did move. And what it did was it, it rotated about 300, just maybe 320 degrees, not a full, not full rotation, but it turned and it aligned itself with the base of the pyramid uh, or the base of the triangle parallel with the horizon with the apex pointed up. And then it started to move, then it started to move up into the sky. And the second that that happened, I felt this wave of calm wash over me. And I describe it as mild sedation uh, mixed with, I wouldn't go as far as calling it apathy, but even a slight disinterest. You know, I, I felt more like, um, more like an observer to this than a participant. I felt kind of removed. Uh, I was in a weird place. I, I don't know, but... Neither one of us, uh, I, I don't think, said a word to one another. Uh, I think the only thing I remember Toby saying was, it's really moving now. And we watched this triangle, these three stars, and we weren't sure, you know, if this is one solid object or, or is this three stars moving in unison. Um, and as it climbed into the sky, it expanded and all the stars remained equidistant to one another and because there were a trillion stars out that night there was this ambient starlight and the sky was a blue but the area inside the triangle was jet black so we knew it was a solid object and it was climbing um, it was climbing straight up uh, and it was also headed slightly in our direction but mostly its trajectory was up and I don't know how high up it got, but it seemed to like reach a ceiling. And once it reached the ceiling, it leveled off. So it kind of distorted the three. It wasn't no longer, we were no longer seeing a triangle. We were seeing three stars kind of in a line, depending on its angle. And then it began a descent. And this, this feeling of sedation that I had came over me in waves. And, and we, we watched this thing, as it descended, it would tumble. Um, and it would go, you know, with the, uh, the point of the triangle would go over the top and on around and um, do like these somersaults. And I don't know where it came from, but I had the thought, you know, this thing's moving with purpose. You know, it didn't look like it was something out of control or... Um, I don't know where that feeling came from, but I had that distinct feeling that it was moving a purpose. And again, we had no fear. Uh, and I don't understand that because we probably should have. And we watched it as it descended and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and finally, it came to a rest about 3,000 feet directly over this meadow. Now this meadow, uh, I describe it in the book as being horseshoe shaped. When we walked it back in 1977, it seemed horseshoe shaped to us. But if you look at the images from Google Earth, you can see it's actually a triangle. And 
the triangular object we saw fit neatly right inside that area. Um, so this thing was big. Uh, I mean, it, it, it was very big. But we didn't know how big because we're watching it at 3,000 feet above our head. Have you, pulling you up on that, have you given, um, I'm sure you've, you've been asked a million times as well as given thought to the fact that maybe you were in its pre-designated landing zone, that it fit neatly in that triangle for a reason, that maybe it had been there before, maybe that's where it always came, maybe that's why it was the size, shape, dimension, and you just happened to walk onto its helipad? I have, and that's what makes those pictures from Google Earth so important, because uh, you'll see it's a, it's a pyramid-shaped area. Uh, you can see from the side angle it's a raised plateau, I posted them to my Facebook page, and I had a, uh, a friend from Alabama who's a landscaper who sent me a message and said, did you look at that close? Did you blow it up? Um, I had never bothered to look for it because I just assumed after 40 years the place would be covered with mature trees by now. Uh, but it's not. It's cut. Somebody cuts it with a tractor. Uh, and he showed me, he blew up, you can blow up that image on Google Earth and see stalks of grass cut. And you can see in some places tractor uh, wheel marks. So there's no paved road up there, just a dirt road. But the government, the Bureau of Land Management, for 40 some years pays somebody and burns the gas to have that clear cut. And keep trees from growing on it. So yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. I think it's a landing pad, and I think it still is. So, uh, and I think the government wow. knew about it. This thing stopped three thousand feet over our heads. Um, and while we're watching it, it shot down a beam of light from the center of the triangle. And this was a, a beam of white light. It had the characteristic of uh, like a high power searchlight cutting through fog, uh, but there was no fog. It was just this visible beam of light. And it was about, you know, six inches in diameter, a uh, perfect column. And it landed square in our campfire and stayed there for maybe 60 seconds, maybe less. And then it turned off and then immediately, and instead there was this laser beam. And I, 1977, I'd seen lasers on TV, but I'd never seen one in real life. Uh, so this laser beam came down and landed. You guys are still at the, far, at the campfire at this point, or you've retreated or you? We are, we are exactly where we were. We were still on our air mattresses exactly where we were when we first saw it. I had sat down and was, rec was reclined, and we watched this whole thing from a reclining position, kind of on our elbows, with no conversation, just there. Which is bizarre, because even if it was a, a helicopter that you recognized, you wouldn't just be sitting there. Even if it was a, a duck flying over your head, and it hovered above the fire, you wouldn't just be sitting there. You, you know? was absolutely inappropriate um, and unexplainable. I wish I could explain my frame of mind because it's, it's odd, but mildly disinterested and like a detached observer is the, is the best way I can describe it. The fact you can't is a, a bit of a clue though, almost, you know? I was in a weird place. I admit that I was, in a, I was in a weird place. You know, I had the thought. Remember, I, I said that I noticed that the crickets, the tree frogs, the forest went still and we lost the breeze. I remember uh, looking at a tree in back of our tent uh, that had a lot of foliage on it. And I'm thinking to myself, even though it's a still outside, one of those leaves should move. And I spent a few minutes watching that and nothing moved and it that that kind of creeped me out in that it seemed almost like i'm looking at 
am I looking at reality or is this, you know? The time itself had paused. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've used that exact word, those exact words. So we saw this laser beam dance around our campsite for about three minutes. Laser beam about the diameter of a pencil, bluish purple in color. It struck me in the chest a couple times. I know it struck Toby a couple times. It hit our car, the tent. And I remember having the feeling that, you know, this thing's checking us out. And, um, it was, I, I, I believe it was. And uh, then it shut off. I mean, like someone hit a switch and we sat there in the silence. And I remember thinking, Toby, you're, you're wrong, man, because the crickets and the tree frogs never did come back. And uh, he suddenly picked up his air mattress and said, show's over. And he went and he threw his air mattress into the tent. And I suddenly, abruptly felt sleepy. I mean, I felt like I had just received an intravenous dose of uh, propofol or something, some type of heavy uh, anesthetic, a hypnotic of some kind or something. And I, I, all I wanted to do was go to sleep. And with this thing 3,000 feet over our heads, we picked up our air mattresses. I picked up mine, I followed Toby's, and I threw mine in the tent crawled in there and uh, we were both out. We were just, boom, we were out. And didn't wake up for, I think about five, five and a half hours. Uh, there's difficulty with the time. Both of our watches, we had good mechanical watches. Um, as emergency medical technicians, we needed good watches. It, it's equipment for the, for the job. And uh, we had wind up watches back in the day. They were mechanical. And both of them had stopped. Mine had stopped at 240 on the nose. Toby's had stopped at 242. Neither one of our watches ever worked again. Uh, interesting, I sent mine back to Elgin because it was less than a year old. And they said the warranty was voided because it had been exposed to, mag to magnetic, uh, a magnetic field. That was the reason for the, uh, for the, uh, for it stopping. So I woke up. That's a hell of a magnet. It, it must have been one hell of a magnet, yeah. I woke up to these flashing lights, uh, again, some hours later, flashing through the tent. And they were yellow and greenish and white, and they were very bright. They were like uh, like an old school from the 60s or 70s flash bulb for a camera, you know, that, that were so bright that, you know, you blink and see this blue dot in front of your eyes for an hour afterward. Um, when these lights would flash and they at, at odd intervals, it would light up the inside of that tent like crazy. Um, but when they weren't flashing, it was pitch dark in there. Um, I woke up and I assumed that these lights were like the overhead lights from a, from a, a ranger's truck or something. And I'm kind of out of it. I don't, I don't have my wits about me. And I'm like, where am I? Oh yeah, I'm, where, I'm camping with Toby. And uh, I looked down and my shoes had been unlaced almost all the way. I had my combat boots on, they were unlaced all the, almost all the way down. And I didn't understand that. Um, you know, one of the things they teach you in the military is to take care of your feet. And uh, I went to bed with my boots on in case I needed to go outside. I, I, so I didn't understand it. And I took one of my boots off and my sock was on completely sideways. I never in a million years would do that. So I took off both, both, both boots, put the socks back on correctly, laced my boots up. And then I turned my attention to Toby, who's on his knees, kneeling and looking out of his flap in the tent. And I could see on the corner of his eyes, whenever the white light would flash, um, from his dark skin, I could see tracks of tears. And they lit up and he'd been crying. 
And um, at this point, I'm, I'm kind of uh, concerned, but I'm not freaked out. I'm not panicked at this point. I'm confused. And I'm like, Toby, man, what is it? Who's out there? Is it park rangers? What's going on? And he gave me the universal finger across the lips and, and said, be quiet. They're still out there. And I'm like, who's still out there, Toby? And he didn't answer me. So I got to my knees and I pulled back the flap on my tent and I looked out and I saw two things. That this craft that had been 3,000 feet over our heads had now descended and was just 30 feet above us. Well, 30 feet above the metal. We were kind of offset. We were near the tree line, thankfully. And it was enormous. I mean, at 3,000 feet, we really couldn't judge its size. Uh, but this thing was not only big, I mean, it was deep. It was like a huge medical building, almost. I mean, it was like maybe five stories tall. Uh, I did a, uh, a drawing of it when we got home, and then I, I redid it. I think I may have sent you a copy. If not, there's a, there's a copy of it on my website. Yeah. So, we're watching this thing. I see this thing, uh, and I'm, I'm, now I'm terrified. I'm absolutely terrified. And from the lights on the on the uh, points of the triangle are still lit, uh, but they've dimmed. So the metal is somewhat illuminated. Uh, but this is some distance away from us, and I see what looks to be maybe 12 or 15 kids wandering around in this meadow. And they're not like they're down looking for something on the ground, they're looking around like, like tourists or something. And I'm like, Toby, man, what are these kids doing out here in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere? And that's when he said to me, Terry, man, those ain't no little kids. Look at them. They're not human beings. Don't you remember? They took us and they hurt us. And as soon as he said those words, Images came flooding back. I've never had a clear linear memory of what all happened, but I have bits and pieces of being inside this thing and, and kind of what they did to us. And uh, we were both burned to a crisp. It was like I had the worst sunburn I'd ever had, but I had it under my arms, the soles of my feet, uh, my scalp. I had it everywhere, uh, and I never took my shirt off, I never, you know, I would have had to been, I don't know how I got this. Um, moreover, I had um, something wrong with my eyes, I, I had what was called a flash burn, it's what an arc welder would get if they didn't use that hood to protect their eyes, and it's essentially a sunburn to the cornea of your eye, it's very painful. And the other thing we had was severe dehydration. I had never in my life been so thirsty. Um, I knew there was something wrong with us and we needed to get out of there. So while we're both watching these little guys scared to death that they're gonna walk in our direction, um, another light came on. From the center and underneath this thing, there came on a light about 30 feet in diameter. It was about as wide as the thing was tall off of the meadow. And it was, again, it had that white, visible light quality to it. And as soon as it came on, these little guys started walking slowly in that direction. And I might mention, they had a peculiar gait when they walked. It was like their, it was like their uh, knees were hinged to move backward or something. It was an odd gait. They had a distinctive walk. And they would walk into this light in pairs and in threes, and within 60 seconds or less, they would just dissolve. They would just dissolve into this light. And we watched until the last two little guys went into the light and dissolved, and as soon as they were gone, the light turned off, uh, and the lights on the, on the points of each triangle stopped changing colors and went to all white, all white light, bright white light, and the, the light intensity increased. It got much brighter. And we saw this thing take off, and it didn't 
take off like a hot air balloon. I mean, it didn't take off like a rocket. It took off like a hot air balloon. It just rose. It just rose in the sky and turned slightly. And the higher it got, uh, the faster it went. And we watched it until it was three points of light and then a single point of light and then it's gone. And we were so afraid because Toby made the remark, what if, what, if, what if some of them are still out there? And um, I was scared to death. We sat in that tent for probably 30 minutes. Uh, and I know that all we had over our heads was a piece of canvas. But it felt, for me, it felt like cover. You know, I wasn't visible. I felt like I wasn't vulnerable. I was afraid to make the, the run from the tent to the car because I thought I'd, I'd, I'd be vulnerable if I did. And, you know, to this day, I won't cut across an open field. Uh, I'll walk a mile around out of my way if I have to, but I won't be out in the open. Um, yeah, I had a couple of strange phobias that, that are still with me. I think are kind of, uh, well, I've been told, they're, I've been tested for PTSD twice. Um, both times I uh, talked to a therapist, both times I uh, did not tell them I saw a UFO. I just told them that I was in the, in the military and had some odd experiences and, and, and I'm having nightmares. And um, it was diagnosed with PTSD slash uh, etiology unknown. Um, so I had uh, 40 years of nightmares, still have them. I mean, uh, once or twice a year, my kids knew, just knew I would had, I'd wake up screaming my head off, you know. And my I mean, wife, I don't... I don't certainly want to delve into some of your, um, you know, very personal business. And obviously going through nightmares is a very personal thing, especially from a PTSD perspective. And so I certainly don't want to dwell or focus too much on it. But nightmares, um, were they nightmares um, of visions of what happened to you that night? Or were they nondescript terrors? Um, or was it almost a kind of regression memory? It was a regression memory. What it was, was it was memories. Now, I've never had a clear linear memory of what happened to us when we were inside that ship or whatever it was. But those nightmares that I have always relate to us being inside that ship. And I can relate a couple to you because I think they're kind of important. Um, for one thing, I, I don't know how we got into this ship, and I don't know if we were even on the, on the ship, because the interior of the ship, I think I described it as being as big as, a, as an office building, the interior of this thing was the size of a, of a football stadium. It was, it was just incredible. It was just many, many times, many full times larger than what it appeared like from the outside. And I recall that we were standing in the middle of like an atrium. And we were both frozen. I couldn't move anything except my eyes. Um, we were both naked. They had taken our clothes off and explains why my socks were on sideways. And I held my belongings, my boots and my stuff in my hands like this. And again, I, I could move nothing except my eyes. I could perceive that Toby was next to me. Uh, but I had no way to communicate with him. And I, I heard a woman screaming. Um, and, and that haunts my sleep because, the, you know, there are different kind of characters of, characteristics of screams. I mean, you can say boo to somebody and they'll scream. Uh, this was a pain scream. This woman sounded like she was hurting. And uh, uh, in front of me, everything that I saw was either stainless steel or white. There were many levels uh, with walkways that went all the way around it. This thing was so big, I had difficulty seeing all the way to the end of it. To my left, there were three saucers parked. I mean, like, like jets under a carrier deck. They were lined up. Um, there were these little guys, these little gray guys, who I have a theory about these. I, I don't think these things are living sentient beings like you and I. I don't, I don't think they have, I don't think they're self-aware. I think they must be some kind of 
combination of biological material and quantum computing and AI and whatever. Uh, but no, I don't think they're alive in the way that you and I are. Uh, but they were all over the place. And uh, moving with purpose, doing something. And uh, while I'm looking, uh, probably the worst nightmare that I had and the most terrifying thing that I experienced on the ship was I saw a taller being, six foot tall, uh, with a chalkish pinkish complexion. And um, I drew a picture of him uh, that I saved. And he, uh, he carried himself like someone in charge, if that makes sense. I mean, he's walking around, he looks like the head guy. So I'm straining my eyes to the left to see him. And just by happenstance, he turns his head and we locked eyes. And that was the most terrifying moment of the whole thing, because as soon as we locked eyes, I don't know any other way to explain it, but this guy was in my head. He was in my head. He knew my wife. He knew my secrets. He knew my plans. He knew everything about me in an instant. And I'm looking in his eyes and it's just, it's just like raw intellect. Um, you know, the best way I can describe this is this. I, I, I got a dog, an English setter, who will come and put his head in my lap. You know, and I'll pet, pet him on top of the head, and he looks up at me with the big brown eyes, and he knows that I'm the alpha, and he knows his role is subservient. And in this exchange, I felt like the dog. I felt inadequate, uh, inferior, uh, and that was very frightening. Very frightening. I feel bad for getting in touch with you and asking you to relive this for people's entertainment, as important as I feel it is. It's terrifying to even listen to. So, you know, my, my heart goes out to you. My respect goes out to you for, for putting yourself through this. I mean, not, not just the retelling to me, but focusing your life, the book, and all the other people who ask you the plethora of questions for their own interest, you know, and I'm sure everyone respects the the personal aspect of it that that, that is yourself. Thank you. But wow, I, I mean, I can't, very much. I, I, it's terrifying I, to even hear. <laughs> but you know, this, I think this is important. And, and I actually, I feel guilty that I sat on this for 40 some years. I mean, had I come forward, I certainly wouldn't have been held my position in government. I would not have my position with the, my peers in the legal community. Uh, it would have been uh, disastrous. Uh, and also, I think in 2018, when I, when I put this book out, I think it, the climate was a little bit different. I think had I published this book five years earlier, it wouldn't have been nearly as well received as it was. Um, and it, there's, there's a little bit of uh, selfishness in this, in that I get something out of this. Every time I retell this story, you know, I come to terms with it better. And uh, it haunts my sleep less. And I feel that I have some control over it. And, uh, and I, want, I, want, I want, just want people to know. Because uh, I, uh, I found out there are a lot of people out there that have experienced very similar things. I put an email address in the epilogue of my book and said, if you've had an experience, please contact me. And uh, that's what I've used to write the second book. People wrote me amazing stories. Um, and I've had just shy of 1,400 emails from people. So every day, almost every day, I get up and answer a couple emails, read people's story, and I respond to everyone. Um, and, um, and it only takes one of those stories to be true a true factual account for it to for it to be something. I, I condensed it down to the 25 most believable. Uh, and I tried to vet the people as best I could to know that they really were who they were. Um, and I'm a pretty good judge. I, I, I talked to everyone by phone as well. And, and I feel like from my experience practicing law, I, I'm a pretty good judge if people are being truthful with me or they're being deceptive. So um, 
Yeah, there are some amazing stories out there, and you're absolutely spot on. If one of those is correct, you know, if I'm correct, um, the stuff is real, and it is real. Our government knows it's real. I'll, t I'll tell you how I know that they know, and that is that when we left that campsite, we left all our belongings there. We left, uh, uh, well, I didn't have my camera, but Toby had a camera in his, uh, in his uh, backpack. And you know the thought of taking a pic, that, that uh, backpack was within a foot of his, uh, where he was laying down. It was within reach. The thought of taking a picture of this thing never crossed our minds. And that makes no sense. I mean, well, because it, it was probably stopped from crossing your mind, you know, by whatever external influence. It, it, you didn't have the power of your own thought to, to make that connection. Right. That's absolutely right. I mean, if you know anyone who's an avid photographer, you, you, you would know the first thing that they would do is, where's my camera? Where's my camera? Uh, no, it never crossed my mind. And I've had a lot of people, lots of stories where people say, boy, I saw this amazing thing. I had my phone in my pocket and it never crossed my mind to take a picture. We got back to the base. I want to touch base on the OSI because I think that's important. Um, the OSI stands for the Office of Special Investigations. It's the investigative branch of the Air Force's security police. Um, when we got back, we were separated. We had, we had no contact with one another. And that was by order. And they enforced that. They would not let Toby and I speak. Not by phone, not in person, not through third parties. And we were being watched. We knew we were being watched. We were reassigned so we would be a, apart from one another. So were and you separated? You, you came back and reported that to a superior and were then separated? Or you were just separated on the line? We agreed on the way back. Um, and we were sick, so we didn't have a lot of conversation. And besides, you know, something had changed. And I don't often mention this, but it, it's, it's so true. Something changed. We were, we were different people when we left that, uh, that meadow. I think like, I feel like we went down there as teenagers and came back as adults. Um, something also changed in the nature of our relationship. This guy was my best friend. His wife and my wife were friends. We played cards, barbecued, socialized on our days off. Um, and suddenly I wanted nothing to do with the guy. And I did not understand that. But I understand now from reading other people's story that that's very common, that a group of friends will witness something in the sky and then suddenly everybody drifts apart or a family will witness something and nobody in the family will talk about it. And if years later somebody brings it up at, you know, Christmas dinner, it's everyone's in shock. Change the subject, you know, that's not to be talked about. Have you come across any theories as to what that might, that might be? And of course you don't know, but have, have, you, have you heard anyone else speculating on, on what that might be? I've had no one speculate on the cause, I, but I've had a lot of people tell me that it happened. I mean, there's a very famous case from the States of four groups of friends, uh, and they were fishing on a, on a lake off the Allagash River in Maine. And they had an amazing story about a UFO. Uh, they went out on a boat to fish at night. They built this huge bonfire so they'd be able to find their way back to camp in the dark to shore. And they went out in a canoe and one of the guys saw a bright light descend from the sky. And then the next thing the four of them remember were they rowed in and doc parked their canoe and they all went to bed and went to sleep. No dog, no, no dialogue, no talk about it, no nothing. The next day, everybody got their stuff and just went home. And these guys didn't talk about this for years. And two of them were brothers. And they both kept having the same nightmares. And finally, one of the brothers reaches out to the other and says, 
man, I gotta ask you, I'm having these weird dreams that relate back to that the fishing trip we had on the Allagash. And he told his brother his dreams, and his brother said, I'm having the exact same dream. And that opened it up, and it became a very famous, well-documented case. Um, but yeah, but the people drift apart, and I think that, I think they wire us somehow to do that. They, they don't want us together. I know the Air Force certainly didn't want Toby and I together uh, because, you know, two people are much more credible when, when there's an event like this. And, uh... So you got um, instructed that in all aspects of your life, whether you were on duty or off duty or your wives, you could have nothing to do with each other, is that right? You couldn't set foot in his house. You were you were almost forbidden from... Now here's what happened. From... My wife took me to the emergency room. I was in a treatment room. Uh, and remember that I worked in the hospital. So I knew all these people. And hospital medical people take care of their own. You know, they do. And um, I was treated like gold. Um, and they couldn't understand how I could get this type of injury. The doctor said, what, were you, were, were you nude on some kind of uh, spit out there on a rotisserie being turned around in the sunlight? How did you get burned like this? Yeah. And I told him the truth, man, I don't know. Uh, were you tested for radiation? I was. And, uh, I mean, you know, I was on a base with enough plutonium to take out Europe, so, yeah. Uh, they're always concerned about that. And the... Um, I didn't see the yellow box. They had a spot, you know, an exam, a light over the exam table, and my eyes hurt, were hurt so bad, they were photophobic from this flash burn I received, that most of the time I kept my eyes shut. But I heard the growl of the Geiger counter, and I, I knew that it should have been a tick, 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 and it wasn't a tick, tick, it was a growl. So, after about a, uh, probably the, most thorough medical exam I ever had in my life. Four guys walked in. That was the base commander, the hospital commander, and two guys in civilian clothes uh, that I did not know, did not recognize. Uh, and the only person who spoke was my commander, the hospital commander, who I'm normally in pretty good terms with. Uh, and, you know, normally we, we would be fairly informal. I mean, I, I gave him the deference that you give to a, to a commanding officer, but we could have a casual conversation. Uh, and he walked in and he said, Sergeant Lovelace, you're to have no contact with Sergeant Tobias in any way, shape, or form. That means you'll not speak with him verbally. You'll not communicate with him through any third parties. You're not to give him anything. He's not to give you anything. You're not to give, they're not to pass any notes. And on and on. And, um, was just was just uh, very adamant and very uh, authoritative, uh, kind of out of character for him. And at the end, he said, "Sergeant, that's an order, and if if you disobey my order, there'll be consequences. Do you understand that?" And I said, "Yes, sir, I do." And uh, and I'll be honest with you, that was in a weird frame of mind. I really didn't want anything to do with Toby. I knew I wanted to see him one more time just to say goodbye to the guy. Um, which I did. I actually I violated the order to do that. Um, and they put me in a, in a private room, which again was odd because normally enlisted men would be in an open ward and they gave me a private room. Uh, and uh, I was there two nights, three days. On the last evening there, I knew I was going home the following day, my night nurse came in around nine o'clock uh, with an injection for me for sleep, for pain. Uh, and they kept the lights turned off in the room because I was my eyes. And uh, two guys in blue business suits followed her into my room. And these guys were just, they were cops. I mean, you could tell they were cops. You know, they had shoulder holsters with a revolver visible. And they had that, um, I don't want to stereotype law enforcement, uh, but they had that kind of swagger that law enforcement can have at that level. And uh, the guy in charge was about 50 years old, 
And there this, the other guy, his junior, was about in his maybe early 30s. Um, the guy in his 50s did all the talking. He was a short guy. He had a flat top haircut, which was kind of popular in the 60s. It was kind of out of style, you know, in this, even in the 70s, but that's what he wore. Um, and uh, they, they showed me their badges and their IDs. I knew the, the guy in charge was a major, the other guy was a captain. They were from the OSI. And uh, I spoke up and I said, sir, am I in some kind of trouble? And the guy said, son, would we be here if you weren't in trouble? And then the captain and him have a, have a laugh at my expense, you know. And they pull up a chair beside my head of my bed. Um, the major pulled a little card out of his pocket, put on some reading glasses, and read my rights, my legal rights, under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Um, which he read, and I didn't understand that I wasn't paying attention. I was just scared to death. I thought, well, what, we burned down the forest or something? What could we have done? I could not imagine a simple trespass. Just jumping the chain, yeah, sure. This, this, this is just in, disproportionate, in, yeah. Uh, if it was a high, a, a serious high security area, it wouldn't have been a chain hooked around a nail, would it? You know, if you'd come across something that you really, okay. really shouldn't have been, then it would have been... You would think, but I mean, I don't know. I mean, I know back, uh, even then, we had electronic sensors because we, we were a missile facility. There were ICBMs spread out in farmland all over the place. Those places had electronic security that wasn't visible. So maybe they did too. But I don't think so. You know what I think? I think that we should have put that chain back up. And I think what probably happened was a park ranger came around and saw that chain on the ground drove in to, uh, to uh, investigate, found our little campsite with everything that we had left there. Well, the only thing I took was my wallet and Toby took a flashlight. Toby left his backpack there, which had his address on it. We both lived on the base. His address was on the base. So it wasn't too tough for the park rangers to put two and two together. And they call the base and they say, I think we think a couple of your airmen have been down here and established a little campsite and it looks like they're planning on coming back. When, when, when after he read me my rights, he, um, and he had this weird accent, Alabama or Mississippi, a Southern accent. And he kept saying, son, I don't understand why you would set up this camp and then not go back. Uh, and he, he's trying to intimidate me. He says, you, you boys got a little marijuana plot growing down there? Is that what this is about? And the first thing crosses my mind is if even just by chance somebody had grown marijuana down there, that they could hang it on us. I mean, it could be, you know, prison, bad news. And uh, I said, no, sir, absolutely not. And he said, you know, well, you wouldn't mind if we took a look in your house then, would you? Do you have anything unlawful in your house you're worried about? And I said, no, sir. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, today I would know better, but, uh, you know, I was 22. I had very little life experience and certainly no legal education. So I thought the protest would make me look guilty. Sure. So I gave him consent. They searched my house. They searched my car. What was interesting was when I got my car back, it was like it had been detailed. It had been washed. Uh, there was no dirt on the tires. There was no dirt underneath the wheel wells. Um, the car had never been that clean since I bought it. So I thought that was very strange. Um, so he finishes this interrogation. Like they've been taking sample, dust samples, searching for, for something, you know, searching it's potentially for data. trace elements of, of something X. In the soil. Yeah, my guess would be radiation. Uh, so that's another thing they did. They, um, the doctor in charge told me, told my wife actually, uh, did Terry bring home anything with him? And she said, no, nothing except his clothes. And he said, I want you to go home, get all this clothing that he wore, everything that he brought back with him, including his boots, and put it in this bag and bring it back to me. And, you know, she didn't ask why. She did as she was told. So I never saw any of my clothing or boots again. But, uh, um, but yeah, they wanted those too. So... 
at the end of this intimidation session, I mean, you know, having been a prosecuting attorney for a while, I understand police techniques in intimidating people in, in the process. And in retrospect, I think a lot of this was just drama. Um, so the captain left, and then it's just me and this major. And the major puts his hand against the door, because the head of my bed is near the door. And he leans over by my ear, and he says to me, he says, Son, I know, and you know, you two knuckleheads stumbled onto something out there, and I think you know what I mean. And as soon as he said that, I knew that he knew. I don't know how he knew, but I think he knew. And I didn't answer him because I didn't know how to answer him. And I sure as hell wasn't going to say, yeah, I saw a UFO the size of, uh, you know, a medical building, uh, because it likely would have put me in a psych ward. But that one detail, that one detail, the one line from him, says more than any of the rest of it, than the rest of it combined. Oh, and it gets better. It got better. Because I didn't answer him, he followed up and he said, Oh, I know you know. And he says, All I want. And he lowered his voice to a whisper and he said, All I want is your film and your camera. So it was obvious to me two things. Number one, they knew that we witnessed a UFO. And number two, they knew that I was a photographer, amateur photographer. And they were afraid that I had a 36 exposure roll of black and white film. God, I wish I had, you know. Um, they, uh, so they knew. I, I, like I said, I don't know how they knew, but they knew. And uh, that led to another interrogation at the OSI office um, where they gave me administered sodium amytal, which is a short-acting hypnotic drug. And um, they tried to hypnotize me, and I pretended to cooperate, but I knew. Uh, my undergraduate degree is in psychology, and I had been taking night classes for a couple of years. So I knew I couldn't be hypnotized against my will. So I resisted all his efforts to hypnotize me. You know, it was a progressive relaxation, walk down the stairs, feeling relaxed, take the next step, feeling twice as relaxed, feeling calm, feeling warm, you know, that kind of thing. And in my mind's eye, uh, I tried to bifurcate my mind and kind of split it in two. And one half of my mind, I'm playing Beatle music, you know, Rolling Stones, you know. And uh, on the other side, uh, whatever, whatever command he's giving me, I'm thinking the opposite. Go down the stairs, I visualize going up the stairs. Relax, I, then I try to covertly tense my muscles. Um, so I did everything I could to resist the... Uh, hypnosis, and I think I may have been somewhat successful doing that, but I had no control over the drug whatsoever. Uh, the drug hit me and bam, it was just, uh, it was just Twilight Zone. A lot of the memories that I recovered uh, came back to me during that session under that drug. So, and I remember them, even though he gave me a uh, command to, uh, to let them go. So, you know, you're not going to remember any of this. When I stamp my fingers, it'll all be gone. I'm going to take this burden off of you. And I thought, you know, like hell, you know, these are my memories. I live through this. I own this and I'm keeping it. I don't we have I two, two quite contrasting points here. You've been unwitting spectators to something. Yes. The arrival of a craft that, by all accounts, and let's just let's just leave this as a single thing that they know about because they know that either they have been informed by the the the, the park rangers, the creatures, the beings. They've been informed, or they're in collusion in some way with it that. Um, that they're, you know, they're responsible for it. So, so you have this thing that you shouldn't have been there. You saw something you shouldn't have seen and we don't want you telling anybody, so we'll remove the memory. But then the other, the other part of it is, and this isn't just with you, this is with any sort of uh, abduction case um, or close encounter case, 
that they they affected you they voluntarily took you they took you on board they you, you know they they showed you things and maybe you weren't supposed to remember but if you were not supposed to be there and not supposed to see that then the mind control capabilities of the craft and its its inhabitants to put you in that state of apathy to 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 make time stand still or whatever those kind of effects are on you that will affect the way that you view reality. It can alter that for you. And it did alter that for you. Yes. If they have that capability, then would it not have been best to just make you think you didn't see something? Maybe you've got some odd dreams. They obviously, there was more to it. And so those two things, I'm not saying they contrast and don't work in your story. I'm saying they don't work in the government story. They do in a way. And I've given that a great deal of thought. And, um, you know, there, there were two purposes to that uh, hypnosis session. Number one was to find out what I saw. And number two was to tell me that that never happened, Terry. That was a dream. That was a hallucination. You had a bad dream while you were in the camp, you know, um, and to try to convince me I didn't see anything. Well, you know, I, I wasn't going to accept that because I knew what I saw. Um, and I think that maybe... I'm not, I don't think, maybe I think, you know, these things, whatever they were, these aliens could have removed those memories. I'm certain of that. They erase people's memories all the time. But I think when they do that, and they do it completely, there's an element of harm involved. Um, you know, my friend um, fell into drink and changed his personality. And, you know, I, I think if if they suppress all of this and you have no memory of it, that it will, it will fester somehow in your subconscious and maybe bubble up and manifest itself in unhealthy ways like alcoholism or drug abuse or um, lots, lots of different things. So uh, I, I just want to mention, and then I'll, I, I don't want to keep you too long because I know you're going to have to pare this down, but uh, I, I did want to mention that um, Shortly after I published the book on Amazon on March 10th, 2018, um, I got some weird phone calls. And then I got a phone call in May of 2018 from Tom DeLong from To the Stars Academy of Arts and Sciences. And uh, I'm embarrassed to say I, I didn't know who he was. He was a musician. Uh, sure. My daughter played his music at her wedding, so I mean, I, but I, I never heard of the guy. And. Uh, he says, Terry, hi, it's Tom DeLong. And I go, well, hi, Tom, how are you? And uh, he says, hey, I want to talk to you about your book. I've read your book, and uh, we'd like to talk to you about your x-rays and the things in your leg. And I'm like, okay. Uh, and we talked, and um, he sent a medical doctor. I agreed to see a medical doctor that he recommended. I won't, I won't say the guy's name because he was very kind to me and he was able to help uh, get some x-rays from the VA that I never knew even existed. He was a also able uh, to, as a radiologist, to triangulate those items in my body from two different angles and identify that they actually were in my body and what, at what depth they were in my body. So um, that, that was a huge help because to me that was validation that this wasn't you know, something on the exam table that got accidentally photographed. Uh, he was able to, from both angles, uh, validate the thing. So I was very grateful for that. Um, and then uh, yeah, he spent two days with me going through my story and uh, was very interested. And uh, then, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him, uh, but there's a a former defense intelligence agent named uh, Luis Elizondo. Sure. Luis Elizondo? Yep. So Luis Elizondo called me. And uh, at the time, I was being plagued by these helicopters. Uh, I had these unmarked helicopters flying over my house. And when I mean over my house, I mean around my house. Uh, and at first it was peculiar, then it was just kind of funny, then it became annoying. You know, and they would come four times a week on average between 9 and 11 a.m. And at that time of day, uh, from my front yard, there was a big tree and in the morning sun, 
So my field of view was limited to 180 degrees in back of me. But these helicopters would buzz around and around, and they do maybe four laps and then shoot off. So I looked up the law. You know, what would a lawyer do? I looked up the law. Um, and it said that the uh, law says that helicopters must display an N, as in Nancy, an N number, yep. followed by a numerical sequence that identifies that particular vehicle. And uh, I started photographing them. And then when I started blowing up the photographs, looking for identification markers on the helicopters, I found UFOs in the background. I may have sent you a picture of one. Uh, I've got a dozen or more. Uh, I also have a friend who's a uh, history professor now, but he was a helicopter pilot in the United States Army, and he knows helicopters. And I sent him about 60 of these photographs, and he was able to identify uh, the type that they were, and uh, that they, they had no markings. And according to the law, there's an exemption at the bottom of the law if it's a federally owned helicopter, any, any, any governmental agency that falls under, the, under that federal umbrella, they don't have to display anything. So, and also he noticed that the pilots in these helicopters were wearing white helmets. Uh, and that was significant and that I, I didn't know this, but civilian helicopter pilots uh, have a disdain for those. They don't wear helmets. They don't like them. It, it obscures their vision. Uh, but the military requires them to wear a helmet. So that's just confirmation that wherever they came from, they were military helicopters. So I had people follow me. I had Did a, they have the little, um, the little camera bubble on the bottom of the chassis of the helicopter? Is that something you noticed? Yes. A little I noticed, perspex uh, yeah, right, bubble. Yeah. yeah, that and a light. Uh, a lot of times a light about maybe so big and it's dim but it's illuminated and it's a light of some kind and uh, everyone that I've showed these pictures to say I don't know what that is never seen that on a helicopter before it's not a searchlight it's positioned near the rear of the craft okay. where it would be you know not a lot of help um, so I don't know uh, but that finally stopped that lasted a little over a year uh, like I said, I took 168 pictures of these things, and um, we decided to move. Uh, it was taking a toll on us, it really was, and uh, we loved the house we were in, but I wanted out of there. And I told my wife, I said, you know, they're just going to follow us. And um, we bought another house, sold my old house, and we moved. Um, and the very first night we were in this house, I woke up the following morning, at 9 a.m., and I heard thump, 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 and I could not believe it, and I ran outside, and 400 feet above our house is this big green Army helicopter. I mean, it didn't say Army on it, but big green unmarked helicopter. As soon as I came out, and I'm in my front yard looking up at it, it peels away. It, like, goes away. So, you know, it was like sending a message to me, you know, we know where you're at. Um, yeah. And that's been over a year and a half now, and they've only been back once or twice. Um, so, Do you yeah. find that when you, um, obviously the second book's not out yet, but when there's a landmark event, when you maybe have spoken publicly, that that attention, that attracts more attention, that that might trigger them coming back around? Is, is there anything that maybe... I've had, yeah, I've had a couple of very bizarre incidents. Um, in February of this year, I was at uh, UFOCon, which was held in San Francisco. And I had a, a little booth with my books set up, and I spoke. And uh, there were these two guys uh, in business suits walking down the aisle, and they just looked out of place. I mean, they didn't look like uh, UFO conference attendees. I mean, um, anyway, I made it a habit uh, to anybody that walked past my table. I'm going to say, hey, how you doing? I'm going to introduce myself. You know, have you seen my book? Have you read my book? Because I want people to read it. And um, I said, hey, how you guys doing? And I stuck out my hand. And the guy looks over at me and says, we know who you are. And kept walking. 
And that was unnerving. That was unnerving to me. When I gave my talk the next, the next day, uh, they sat in the back. Never said a word, uh, sat in the back. Uh, I spoke before the um, MUFON uh, group down in Houston, Texas, about four hours south of where I live. And uh, had a nice talk, and I had a nice uh, dinner afterwards, and just a good time. And uh, they're just good people. They're very interested and devoted to the study of the topic. So on the way home, I had a white van follow me. And we're a four and a half hour drive away. And uh, this van's following me for two hours. And I'm changing lanes. And uh, I would slow down. It would slow down. So I pull off the highway at an exit. And uh, it pulls off the highway. I parked at a gas station. And it parked across the street. It's not even subtle. It's not That's even, it just seems like they're not even trying to hide. That's subtle at all. There's no subtle, subtlety to it whatsoever. Yeah. There's also no license plate on the front of the thing. So, and they certainly never let me get in back of them. So when they pulled back out, I pulled back out on the highway and here they came right after, right after me. So I slowed down, you know, speed limit 75. I slowed down to 30 miles an hour. And they're hanging back a quarter mile back and back of me doing 35 miles an hour. So uh, this went on for about three hours and they finally pulled off the road. Uh, and then a, a couple weeks later, maybe a month and a half later, we had a silver Lexus uh, park in front of our house. Now we live in kind of a quiet subdivision. Uh, it's limited to 24 houses. It's secluded a little bit. It's off the main drag. Uh, so we don't have, you know, cross traffic. And I noticed this, um, this silver uh, Lexus parked across the street. Now, the house across the street I knew was empty. It had just been sold. So I thought that was odd. And, uh, and they're there every day. And this goes on for four or five days. And then uh, in the evening, around 9 p.m., they'd leave. And in the morning, they'd come back. And somebody Fine. sits in there. Somebody sits in there. Yeah, well, the windows are tinted. Windows sure. are heavily tinted. So being in Texas, I, I took my camera and my handgun, and I went out, and I knocked on the window, and uh, the guy rolls down the window about that much, and I could see inside two guys in suits. And I said, hey, how you doing? What are you guys doing staking out my house? Didn't say a word, rolled up the window, drove away. I got a picture of the license plate. I thought, cool. So, track, I, through a friend in law enforcement, I had the uh, plate traced, and it was a rental, a rental out of Dallas Fort Worth Airport. So, um, I don't know. That was just intimidation. What have you, over the years of, of writing about it, of speaking to people about it, of getting their opinions, of hearing other people's stories. What is your um, leading theory on the government's involvement in Got the government? I've answer for that because I've given that 40 years of thought. Uh, and I might mention just real quick, when I was on that craft, one of the memories I have were there were six people that were human. I mean, they were human like you and I and they wore tan colored flight suits and they wore what looked like standard issue combat boots and they walked around that, that ship like they were crew members and I think those were human beings and I think those were somehow affiliated with our government, somebody's government, who knows. But I think that either world governments and ET are working hand in hand in concert towards some shared agenda or I think that ET and the governments of Earth entered some type of an agreement um, because I think there's also a big issue, David Politis writes about it, about people that vanish under mysterious circumstances. Lots of people vanish. Um, yeah, that, that stuff's really, really bizarre. The missing 411 stuff, that's so yeah. weird. Yes. The Missing 411 series, uh, the, I found the fourth chapter in his book is all about Devil's Den. 
And I could tell you, if we had time, I'd tell you half a dozen crazy stories about Devil's Den. It just wouldn't blow your mind. So I think that maybe there was an arrangement where they could take cattle and people um, for whatever purpose, um, and in exchange they gave us something. And I think that may have begun, begun as a... Um, as the government seeing the loss of some of its citizens as just collateral damage and the price they pay for technology or something. Um, Which it would, you know, not, not just the U.S. government, but I, I, I would say high-level government would see the loss of some civilian life is worth, is, is a small price to pay for yes. you know, X, Y, and Z. You know, we, we, we know from purely terrestrial exper experiences in the past, that that's exactly how the government sees you. And my third, and what I believe is the correct um, explanation, and this is just an assumption on my part, I have nothing factual to base this on, um, but I think what began as some type of treaty or some type of an agreement of some sort um, has just dissolved. Uh, I don't think that they respect, I don't think they understand the law of contract. I think that they are, they are, are going to do what they want to do. We have no power to stop them. And the best that our government can do is give them what they want and try to try to manage um, things as best they can. Uh, you know, I worry about the divisiveness in, in my country in particular right now. Uh, it's like I've never seen before. And um, the split between people, the chasm between people that have and have not, um, you know, uh, it sets the scene for civil unrest, maybe a civil war in this country. I, I don't know. And I wonder if E.T. has a hand in that. Uh, I got to have, a, I just, I feel like they have a hand in running this world somehow you know, for whatever nefarious purposes they might have, I think that they're in control somewhere. Uh, again, it's just a guess, but that's my feeling, my, my gut. And also, the, you know, the big deal is too, we're not, uh, to use my dog analogy, we're not, uh, we're not the top of the food chain anymore. I mean, when we're, in an, we're, we're, when we're in, in engaged in an encounter with these things verbally or to make a treaty or whatever, we got to remember we're the dog in the equation here. So yep. we're at a disadvantage. It's like a four-year-old negotiating a contract with a you know twenty-nine-year-old uh, lawyer. I mean, it's it's not an equal playing field, an even playing field. So sure. Well, it is, and that's what I was saying to you before that I have respect for you um, reliving what is ultimately an incredibly traumatic and life-changing experience of your own which has had ramifications that have lasted on into you know kind of your later life um and 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 still do even to the point where you're being followed from a home move and your poor innocent wife is is also being party to helicopters flying around years and years decades later um that that, that should be entertainment and of course my podcast is entertainment but actually what i'm doing is i'm desperately trying to sit speak to other people as we collectively try and seek some form of truth or at least try and seek whatever that next step is to collectively some, finding a truth I hope some, and that's entertaining it's fun it's fun for me but you can't forget and i hope some component of it is entertaining because if it's entertaining then it's engaging and then people will listen and maybe maybe be more aware and think about well, maybe this is maybe this is possible so I think that entertainment component in an appropriate amount <laughs> is absolutely fine. Sure. Uh, but the truth is the, is the object of the exercise. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, so very much um, for going through it all, for reliving it all with me. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time um, to come and to, to talk through your story to tell us all and to share some of these terrifying truths with everybody. I really appreciate it. My book is on Amazon uh, and it sells in 11 countries. And uh, um, the name of the book is Incident at Devil's Den. And it's available in a paperback book with images, photographs, drawings in the back, uh, a Kindle version. And I did an audio book in my own voice to tell the story. 
And the second one, the second one, do you know, do you have a release date for it? November 1st is what we're shooting for. Um, but I, I have a couple of stories. I just keep, the more I keep digging, the more I keep finding. Um, so I'm going to end up with 25 core stories from people that are just uh, mind blowing. Then I also include uh, the details of what happened to Toby, which are crazy in itself. That's a, a 30 minute story. So, yeah, November 1st is what we're shooting for. And it'll be on Amazon as well. Amazing. And you have a website as well, don't you, which is... I do. I, I have a woefully inadequate and under-managed uh, website <laughs> that has some pretty cool images on it uh, and a link to Amazon. It's terrylovelace.com. Uh, and I'm also um, on Facebook at Incident at Devil's Den. So uh, people can hit me up on Facebook. They can uh, go to the website. If they have a pressing question or if they've had an experience and would like to talk to me, I'll answer anybody's email. Uh, the email is lovelace.landpope, L-A-N-D-P-O-P-E, at gmail.com. And they're welcome to talk to me. Awesome. Awesome. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate your time. I appreciate yours. I know I took a lot of your time. And I, and I appreciate it very much. Peer Beyond the Veil has been written and presented by myself, Mark Watson, as part of the Fierce Game Media Network. Music and soundtracks are credited and licensed to Purple Planet and to Kevin MacLeod, licensed under Creative Commons. All rights are reserved by our parent company, MLW Publishing. You can follow us at facebook.com forward slash peer beyond the veil or on Twitter at peer beyond the veil or at peer beyond 2020. Please click the like and subscribe buttons when you see them, most importantly, wherever you listen to your podcasts. It helps us to attract the attention we need to keep the show going, to get the guests that you all want to hear from, and to help more and more people 